episode of the Fresh Fiction Podcast is brought to you by Ravel Books and Bethany House, publishers of Everything She Didn't Say by Jane Kirkpatrick. Inspired by true events, Jane Kirkpatrick's new novel, Everything She Didn't Say, reimagines the life of memorist Carrie Strayhorn as she traveled across early 20th century America. Upon the publication of her 1911 memoir, Strayhorn shared with readers insight into her 25 years on the road with her husband. Jane's versions of the events pulls aside the curtain to show the feelings Carrie couldn't share in her memoir as she navigates her life and relationships. As emotions bubble under the surface, Carrie must find her place in a life that is constantly on the move. I'm pleased to welcome Jane Kirkpatrick to the podcast. Thank you, Jane, so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Well, I am so excited. I bet you are as well, because tomorrow uh, is September 4th, and it's the book birthday. It is. <laughs> it's going to appear in, in stores everywhere, we hope. So. Yes. Do you feel like uh, your release day comes um, faster or slower than you usually expect it? Um, I, I don't know. It's, I just, it's sort of typical, I guess I'd say that. So, yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any great expectations for or either way, it's always sort of, it just happens, and it's um, an exciting time. So Awesome. Well, Jane, um, I'm really curious to know more about you. Can you tell our listeners um, a little bit about yourself and how you got started writing? Well, I used to write what I called wretched little poems. <laughs> they were, um, you know, really bad little poems when I was much younger. But I was always interested in words and the sounds of words, and I thought words were funny and I grew up on a dairy farm in uh, Wisconsin, and I can remember my older sister telling me the name of these little fluttery things that would flutter around the mud, the mud holes, um, and she called them butterflies. And I, I remember laughing at that because I knew what butter was, being we had a dairy farm, right. and I knew what flies were, being that we had a dairy farm. <laughs> and so, and a butterfly was certainly neither of those. And so I can remember that kind of trying to make those connections out of words. So that that was part of my early interest in um, in writing. And I really didn't get into writing for other people to read until we, my husband and I, made this decision to move from what I called, you know, from Bend, Oregon, um, to what I called Rattlesnake and Rock Ranch, this really remote area <laughs> that we then spent 27 years um, building a life there. Wow. But I had really, I had wonderful teachers who um, would say kind things about my writing, and, and when I was, um, my first professional life before I became a writer was as a mental health um, specialist, and I was the director of a clinic, and and I realized there that words had power because I would write to the state or deal with legislative issues and I would get calls back saying, you know, we hadn't ever thought of that this way. And so then we could move forward with making some changes. So words had power, but I didn't think of them as fictional things um, mm-hmm. until much later. And, and that was because I wanted to write a biography about a woman that I had read about, a historical woman, and I, I just couldn't find in, enough information about her to write a biography. I could find lots of things about her husband and her father How and frustrating. her brother. Yeah. yeah. Somebody the other day said, because uh, I had commented that I find a lot of these women I write about in footnotes of other works, yeah. and this woman said to me, yeah, women are footnotes, <laughs> you know? um, and I wanted, I wanted to tell this woman's story and have her be more than a footnote. And I just couldn't get enough material, so that's when my husband said, well, maybe you should think about writing a novel. And I, I you know, I resisted for quite a while, um, but finally I thought, I actually read a quote from Virginia Woolf who said that women's history must be invented, both uncovered and made up. And that sort of gave me a permission to, to try to tell the story of these women using fiction to sort of fill in the fill in the spaces. I still research like I'm writing a biography, but I then fill in the blanks. That is so fascinating. So how long had Carrie's story been with you? About 12 years. Wow. (laughs) So it kind of percolated. I, you know, I'd written several other stories, uh, you know, in between that. But about 12 years ago, a woman who had been reading my work and liked it, um, told me about this memoir that Carrie had written, and and it was published in 1911, about her life traveling on stages and trains and and with her 
um, husband. She was Carrie was a very uh, well well educated, one of the first women to graduate from the University of Michigan. And her father was a doctor. Her sister became a doctor. So she was really well, you know, well established. And she marries this writer who turns out to get a special job from the Union Pacific Railroad, um, starting the public relations company or part of the department. And then they were off. And so um, this uh, woman who now actually lives about 12 miles from me <laughs> said, you know, I, I love your work and here's a story that might interest you. And so I got, you know, replicas of the original memoir that were um, available and it was two volumes and I read it and I thought, you know, gosh, this is an incredible amount of information and it's really a love story about the West. Um, but there were all these little things that I thought, hmm, you know, what isn't she telling us? And so that that had to percolate for, I guess, 12 years before I took the risk of seeing if I could um, get, get the story. I, I liked what you said in your opening about pulling back the veil mm -hmm. to try to see what, what was behind that. What was it that was interesting about her, but also how did you decide which questions to answer? Well, part of it was I um, started doing additional research about her, and so I was looking at census records, I was looking at um, documents, things that had been written, um, her husband's own uh, memoir that he wrote when he was in his 90s after she had passed away. Um, and then there were a couple of books that were written about her and about her, about her literary life, um, because she also wrote, and so it was reading those those pieces, getting that kind of information, and looking at how uh, she only had three permanent homes in the 30 years, 25 to 30 years of travel. And I really wanted to explore that rootlessness and what she might have been missing. She also, um, they didn't have any children, and I didn't know... Um, she doesn't address that at all in the memoir, but every mention of a child in the memoir is very poignant. Hmm. And there's one scene, uh, one part of her story, basically, where um, a woman, and this is, they were building the town of Caldwell, Idaho at that point, and a woman approaches her with a, a set of twins, and she has already, I think, 11 children. And she says, you know, these these two babies, um, we just can't, we can't keep all of our children, and we're looking for, you know, people who would be able to take these twins and give them the kind of life that we won't be able to give them. And so she offers them up to Carrie, and that little interaction is just so poignant. You know, I wanted to explore more about what that would have been like, and why didn't they take this why didn't they t accept this? Yeah. Um, what was it um, that was missing? Especially since later, when I um, got census records, um, after the, the memoir came out, um, it lists, at that point they were extremely wealthy again, um, and the census record showed all the members of the household. So there was Robert and Carrie, and the first maid and the second maid and the chauffeur and all these other people that were living in this house. Um, in Spokane, Washington, and also listed were two boys. They were um, the last names were different, but they were recorded by the census taker as children of Robert and um, Carrie. When I tracked them, actually, they were the children of the chauffeur. But obviously, they had become a part of their lives, mm -hmm. and Carrie was more than willing to have them be um, have them be noted as their children. And so that, that became an important part of the storyline about, um, you know, the difficulty it might have been to have children and travel that much. Um, but also, Robert, Robert, the title of Robert's um, memoir when he was in his 90s is called My 90 Years of Boyhood. And so a part <laughs> of me thought, you know, perhaps she had a lot to take care of with Robert and having children might have just been you know, more than they could have managed because mm -hmm. he was, you know, he was someone that she really um, looked after. He got sick a lot. <clears throat> I think he had had tuberculosis, um, and she was often having to take care of him because of his lung problems. So, you know, that all of that might have fit in. Of course, those are things that she didn't talk about, but that we found in the newspaper, for example, 
that when he was sick, they would record that because they were so prominent. And she was obviously the caretaker for him. It's so incredible um, how she made such an impact on the communities that she was in, but you had to really dig and dig and dig to find information out about yeah. her while you were doing your research. Yes, and actually find identifying um, the work of developing Caldwell, this, um, you know, this town, mm-hmm. and then her passion. Um, and I really think it was probably the, the most important part of, her, of all the work that she did about celebrating the West, and that was starting the, the uh, Presbyterian Church in Caldwell. And it's still the only Presbyterian church um, that was actually started without having first having a, like an itinerant pastor that would come out. So these um, eight or nine women were the ones that got behind. They wanted a church with a pastor, and they literally called the pastor. Um, and uh, he la- he came, and, and that was a big moment because he really, when he got there, he saw that it, they really had a lot more work to do. Um, but he stayed on and um, eventually helped develop the College of Idaho, which is still a, um, a Presbyterian college in Caldwell, Idaho. Um, when the when it was accepted by the Presbytery as a as a legitimate Presbyterian church, the trustees were all men because that was it was 1883 right. in that period of time. So, uh, but but it was it's still recorded as a remarkable. Um, effort on behalf of the women of Caldwell who really wanted to have their own um, faith experience and be able to have their own church, and and they were able to do that. And I think that was the highlight of her of her wandering. Um, and that was one of the few places that they actually had a permanent home was in Caldwell, Idaho. Were you doing research at all in Idaho? Part of when you, when I think about how long it's taken me to write the book. You know, it, it took me a year to get it down on paper, but I've probably been researching it for, you know, those 12 years. Another 12 because, years, yeah. Yeah, so I've been in Spokane. I've been in Caldwell. I've been in all these different places. Um, but I'd never spent the time, you know, looking up the histories of those towns or, you know, reading newspaper accounts about them or uh, reading a, a, a fat little document about the irrigation system um, <laughs> develop that Robert, you know, helped develop in Caldwell, Idaho, because it was just a desert. Um, and I, I spoke to a woman the other day who said that she had grown up in Caldwell and went to the Presbyterian Church there and hadn't known any of this um, about the history. She said, I just wanted to get away from the desert. <laughs> and so, And I said, and you even had trees when you were there, and they didn't have anything like that until... Um, the irrigation system or company was um, established. Wow. Yeah, Robert and uh, Carrie had such an impact on Caldwell. That's so impressive. They did, yes. And they had, you know, I think they had a pretty major um, impact just on the development generally of the West Mm -hmm. uh, because he wrote about what was happening. And, of course, part of what the railroad wanted was for him to write things that would encourage people to leave their comfortable little homes in Missouri and Iowa and head west um, to develop the, you know, to to bring people into the the western experience. And it wasn't always, um, let's see, how could I I describe this? It wasn't always, um, it was a a hopeful um, description of what they might find someday when there were trees and water, (laughs) but he wrote it as though this is what you'll find. It's, it's this wonderful place. And, and part of the, you know, the most distressing periods of Carrie's life, I think, is when people um, got excited about Robert's enthusiasm and his vision for the future that didn't always come to pass. Then they had to deal with the disappointments of their friends who had invested in, in land that, um, where the railroad didn't come. You know? And so that was, th- those were very painful times. What was one um, moment that you were the most excited about getting to put on the paper and share with readers? I think it was when they were going to Yellowstone National Park, mm-hmm. and she was the first white woman to go in there, and they, it was just she and Robert and the head, the park manager, and the owner of the stage company who would be bringing people into the park. And it was late in the year, um, and she writes about this, you know, this scene of, of several days and and some funny things that happened while they were in the park and and she doesn't dwell on 
on what I found was to be one of the most amazing things, and that was that she rode horseback 100, about 144 miles wow. in four days. And the weather turned on them. They had um, the horses broke free at one point, and she had to sit for long hours um, in the middle of you know grizzly country while they went to look for the horses. Um, and she doesn't say much about that, but to me, I, I've I've gone hunting with my husband um, in the wilderness areas, and and one time I just was sitting and waiting for him, and I I couldn't tell where he'd gone. I got sort of disoriented myself. I tried to find out where we had entered, and eventually, I you know, I kept calling out to him, and and he wasn't even that far away. But the sounds are different in that kind of vast expanse. And I remember feeling really frightened for a period of time, and and he was very comforting about that. Um, and but and we weren't even riding, we weren't even riding at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so for her to have ridden that much, and she says that it, she was so frozen by the time that they got back to um, a camp area that had heat that she had to be lifted off the horse by three the three men. And and I suspect with that kind of cold. Um, she probably had lifelong uh, effects from that, from um, frostbite with her, on her fingers and so on, even though they they spent a good amount of money and she talked about getting really good equipment for, that was available at the time. So that was, you know, I wanted to both celebrate what that would have been like to be the first woman to come into this vast place without any crowds and, you know, no roads really, um, and to see Yellowstone. Know, falls and to see the, you know, the geysers and and the great beauty of the lakes and all of this incredible landscape, and at the same time to be um, to find herself lost and frightened and not sure what was going to happen next, um, if they were going to find those horses or how they get back or not. Fortunately, they did find the horses because they got to some kind of a hot uh, lake area. And, and they didn't, the horses wouldn't cross over it. So the men were able to come up upon them and get them back. But, wow. but you know, that wouldn't have been, to my, in my mind, that would have been a scary time. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, I was getting chills as you were telling the story. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think that that, you know, I, um, I, and again, because she was so upbeat about it, you, you knew that she was just a trooper, that she would come through the roughest of times. And clearly, she did. But at the same time, um, I think she, you know, she was she was like the rest of us in that there are times when we are fearful, and you know, prayer comes into our life, and we are grateful that we have something um, beyond what's just in front of us to bring us comfort in a difficult time. Well, speaking of things that bring us comfort, Jane, one of the things when you're not writing, um, you probably like to unwind and you are probably enjoying some new books or maybe an audio book or, or a movie or a TV show. We are always curious to hear from our authors about what they're currently enjoying. Well, I, um, I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, you know, obviously that's part of that's part of how I find these women in the footnotes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, and, um, and so I read a lot of nonfiction, and the current nonfiction I'm reading is a book called The Troubled Life of Peter Burnett, who was one of the first, he was the first governor of California. And it's a very interesting, it's by um, Gregory Noakes, um, who, who writes, I say he writes history the way it should be written. So it feels like you're reading a novel, and it's really well presented. Um, and and Peter Burnett was um, an interesting man in that he had all these possibilities, but he kept messing up. And so he, you know, he hoped to make a lot of money, and he and he would, or he would be a leader. He got elected governor, and then he quit. So you know, it was just this kind of an interesting personality. Yeah, for sure. Of the old frontier. And then um, I've. Um, I just actually met um, at a, I was at an event for um, church librarians and and got to meet an author named Kate Breslin, um, and the, the book she has is called High as the Heavens, and I had, I think it's like her third or fourth book, but I hadn't read anything by her, and it's a, kind of a World War II, um, you know, that's the setting uh, during World War II, and so that's part of what I'm reading. And um, and then I just got in the mail because I had ordered it mm-hmm. uh, three ro- three romantic suspense novellas 
with Dee Henderson, Danny Petrie, and Lynette Eason called The Cost of Betrayal. Oh. And I'm looking forward to that because I, I remember um, Willa Cather, who won the Pulitzer Prize, she said that the emotions that um, drive most of the things we like to read as adults are based on experiences that we had before we turned 15. And then she said that the emotions that drive that are passion and betrayal. And so I was intrigued by the title of this, The Cost of Betrayal. Oh, for so, sure. Yes, I think that'll be interesting. That'll be fun. Uh, yeah. Jane, we're, our time is almost up. We had such a wonderful time talking with you. But before I let you go, how can readers find out more about you and stay in touch with you? Well, I have a web page, um, which is jkbooks.com. And you can sign up there for my monthly Story Sparks, which is a is an e-newsletter that goes out to people who have signed up. And it's mostly kind of a, I have an essay on encouragement, you know, things that for people to think about. Um, I usually, my dog sometimes has his column um, and, <laughs> and talks about what it's like to live with a writer type. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I usually celebrate someone else's book um, that I'm reading and also... Um, just talk about, you know, this this last issue, I talked about chained libraries, which I had never heard of. Um, but back in the medieval times, all the library books, which were so valuable, sometimes as, you know, as valuable as a farm, but they all had chains on them so that you couldn't walk away with them. Oh, wow. And, and there is, a, in, well, most of them are in England, but there are still some chained libraries. And there's even a YouTube video that you can watch about how they managed um so anyway I, I get excited about stuff like that and that goes in my newsletter it's a good reason to sign up for the newsletter guys <laughs> that's right yeah so it's called story sparks um and th- so that's the best way and i have my schedule in there and, and also my schedule online so uh, people know where i'm going to be and and um and how to connect with me because they can they can visit the it's called the webmaster you visit it and it comes directly to me so i i can talk with my fans that way and i also have a facebook page and an author just author jane kirkpatrick um page on facebook well jane thank you so much this was so much fun chatting with you and i hope you have a great book birthday and thank you so much for your time today oh it's been a pleasure thank you Hey guys, Gwen here. If you love what you hear, there are a few ways you can help us during season two. First, don't forget to subscribe to the Fresh Fiction Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts or any of your other favorite podcast apps. Rating, reviewing, and sharing the podcast with your friends also helps us out more than you'll ever know. Because, you know, sharing is caring, as they say. You can always find me on Twitter and Instagram as Real Vixen. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Jane Kirkpatrick for joining me today. You can find everything she didn't say anywhere books are sold. Thank you to Ravel Books and Bethany House for their continued support of the podcast. Make sure you stop by freshfiction.com to find out more about Jane and other Ravel Books and Bethany House authors. Hope you guys enjoyed today's episode, and until next time, happy reading.